What can we learn from Saving Private Ryan's final battle scene that we can apply in games like Arma, Hell Let Loose, Squad, Postscriptum, and any other large team-based tactical game? I'm Death Screens, and we're gonna break down the defensive tactics the Americans used in this battle. We'll look at what they did well and what they could improve upon so you can utilize those lessons learned the next time you're defending an objective. And as you're watching this, make sure you comment with movie battles or video game scenarios you want me to analyze in the future. Saving Private Ryan tracks Captain Miller and a squad of his rangers in the days after D-Day as the Allies try to expand their foothold in Normandy. For Captain Miller and his rangers, this all comes to a head in a French town called Ramel. Ramel is a critical strategic location for both armies because it has a bridge across the Murderet River. The Germans need to secure this bridge so they can get armor, troops, and supplies over the river to support their counterattack. On the other hand, the Americans' priority is to prevent the Germans from taking the bridge in order to stop their counterattack. Their second priority is to keep the bridge intact so the Allied armies can advance without losing the initiative. The forces fighting at Ramel are extremely lopsided. The Germans have between 50 and 100 infantry, supported by two Tiger tanks, two tank destroyers, a half-track, and a 20mm flak cannon. Captain Miller, on the other hand, has two machine guns, one sniper, two bazookas with only eight rounds, a handful of Hawkins mines, and about 16 rangers and paratroopers. Now, I don't want to go into an in-depth analysis of intelligence preparation of the battlefield, it suffices to say that Captain Miller conducts a hasty analysis. Captain Miller decides that his best chance to stop the Germans is if he can fight them on the inland side of the bridge. Since Captain Miller's combat power is very limited, he wants to bait the Germans into committing to the main street. The main street is covered in rubble and shell craters and is flanked on both sides by multi-story buildings. Captain Miller wants to mass his combat power on that street and ambush the Germans there. By doing so, he wants to destroy a Tiger tank and turn it into a roadblock for the rest of the armor. Captain Miller positions the bulk of his infantry toward the end of the street, using the rubble, shell craters, and the building on the left side of the street as cover. He has random buddy teams teams of paratroopers take positions inside the buildings on the street to cause mayhem and disrupt the Germans. He then emplaces his two machine guns and his sniper. One machine gun takes a position in the rubble on the corner of this building at the end of the street. The other machine gun accompanies Jackson, the sniper, in the church tower up the street. Captain Miller develops the engagement area for his ambush by ensuring that he has the street covered by interlocking sectors of fire to engage any infantry moving up the street. He also buries several Hawkins mines in the rubble along the sides of the street. When it's time to initiate the ambush, the paratroopers will detonate the Hawkins mines to kill as many infantry as possible. The machine guns and sniper will then initiate and destroy any infantry left in the open. Once a tank is alone and vulnerable, the paratroopers will use handheld sticky bombs to try to knock out the tank's track and turn it into a roadblock. In the event the Americans cannot hold their defensive position, they'll fall back across the bridge to a last stand position they've designated the Alamo. Once there, they'll detonate explosives they've placed under the bridge to destroy it and prevent the Germans from securing it. Now let's look at how this battle unfolds, then we'll analyze whether it was effective and what Captain Miller could have done better. We can see right away that the tank destroyers, a half-track, and a couple of squads of infantry pass the engagement area and begin moving toward Captain Miller's right flank, out of sight. So no matter what happens from here on out, he has an enemy force that can maneuver on him. Half-track just went by with about 20 troops. Tiger tank and three squads of infantry then commit to the main street, putting them right in Captain Miller's engagement area. Everyone holds their fire until the paratroopers initiate the ambush with Hawkins mines. The initial volley of fire is exceptionally effective. Because Captain Miller has placed interlocking sectors of fire, he successfully destroys all of the infantry in the open, leaving the tank vulnerable. Captain Miller then attempts to capitalize on the initiative they've seized by knocking out the tank's track, but it fails. He then learns he's being flanked on the right by 30 infantry, so he repositions his second machine gun to the right flank. The paratroopers knock out the tank's track and destroy the crew with small arms and grenades, and the paratroopers in the building cause mayhem as intended. The Germans then break through the right flank with their 20mm flak gun and destroy about a third of Captain Miller's troops all at once. The Americans are forced to displace, allowing the Germans to sweep through the street. The ambush has now descended into disarray and the Americans are left fighting as a collection of uncoordinated buddy teams. These positions are reduced one at a time, leaving Captain Miller trying to hold the shell craters in the open without support, and he's eventually forced to fall back to the Alamo. The Americans fail to destroy the bridge but are saved by a P-51 Mustang. 
It destroys the Tiger on the bridge, creating a roadblock and forcing the Germans to retreat. Now, was this plan effective? Well, yes and no. But hey, if you enjoy tactical content, don't forget to like this video. It'll tell the AI algorithm overlords that you want to see more of these videos and it will help push this video out to more people. Now, I want to look at three areas the positioning of the machine guns, the actions taken after the ambush, and whether Captain Miller selected the best engagement area in the first place. Captain Miller did not select ideal positions for his machine guns, which are his two most casualty producing weapons. The ground level machine gun is set up at an angle that only allows it to provide oblique fire and only if the enemy infantry advance far enough up the street to enter its sector of fire. It would be much more effective to set up the machine gun down the long axis of the street, and here's why. The enemy force will generally be arrayed in a column in this case, meaning their long axis is in line with the road. If the machine gun is also positioned down the long axis of the road, the gunner can achieve enfilade fire, meaning the axis their rounds are traveling down overlaps with the long axis of the enemy unit. This allows the gunner to hit the maximum number of enemy targets, more than he could with oblique fire or flanking fire. So for the initial ambush, Captain Miller could have moved that gun to one of the shell craters and swapped it out with the BAR. The position in the church tower, on the other hand, is an effective firing position. It has great observation in fields of fire, but it's exceptionally exposed. If this were real life, the Germans would suppress and destroy that position as soon as the machine gun got off its first volley. Moreover, by utilizing this position, the Americans have poor lines of communication. When defending a position, the defenders must establish good lines of communication, meaning short, easily traversable routes they can use to reinforce their perimeter or to resupply key weapons. Here, they can't get to that gun easily, meaning they can't resupply it effectively. The gunner and sniper can't get out of that position easily either, meaning they can't get out and fall back. This means they can be isolated and cut off from their unit. That's exactly what happens in the movie when the 20 millimeter and then all the infantry break through the right flank. Captain Miller could have instead positioned that machine gun closer along his right flank in a position that would be easier to resupply and would provide more protection from the 30 infantry maneuvering around the buildings. Not only that, but with the church tower, Captain Miller has very little command and control over one of his most casualty producing weapons. He can't designate targets or reallocate sectors of fire. He essentially is deciding that once the battle begins, he's okay with completely giving up control over that machine gun. Not the best decision. Infantry's moving to the left. Captain Miller seized the initiative early on by executing an effective ambush on the infantry and isolating a German Tiger tank. However, this initiative only lasted a minute or two. Captain Miller has very weak flank security in this ambush position, and he knows he's being actively flanked by an entire platoon and multiple armored vehicles. The decision to hold this position instead of displacing is what ultimately causes the defense to fall apart at this point. We do that. We got a fighting chance at a flanks. If Captain Miller wanted to initiate his ambush on the inland side of the bridge, he could still have fallen back to supplemental fighting positions. But Captain Miller doesn't do this, and he allows the Germans to regain the initiative. Now, did Captain Miller select the best engagement area and battle positions in the first place? Reasonable minds can disagree here. In my opinion, it was not the best option. There was some wisdom in ambushing the Germans where he did because it slowed them and prevented them from being able to mass all of their combat power at one decisive point, which in this case would be the bridge. You can see this strategy play out in bridge attack maps in Postscriptum. If you have, you know how difficult it can be to mass your forces for a bridge crossing if you have to fight through an enemy ambush on your side of the bridge before you can even get to the bridge. So in that respect, I do like his plan to ambush them there. However, in my opinion, Captain Miller should not have used that street as their primary battle position. I think a better option becomes apparent if we look at the terrain here. In his original battle position, Captain Miller not only had to execute his ambush, but he had to secure his flanks. However, Look at the end of the street. You've got a massive open area there. The Germans are ultimately going to have to cross that open area. After they cross it, they have to funnel all of their forces across a narrow bridge, once again in the open. This entire time, they are exposed. If Captain Miller could knock the tank treads out in that funnel, the German advance would effectively be halted and the enemy would be sitting ducks while the Americans raked them with fire. In a position across the river, 
the American flanks would be protected and all fires could be focused on the enemy's advance. Taking this even one step further, you can see there are sandbags, some sea wire, rubble, etc. all over the place by the bridge. The time the Americans spent sitting around and listening to Edith Piaf and talking about bras could have been spent creating obstacles to further canalize the German infantry and slow their tanks as they crossed the open area. There are some key takeaways if you're defending an objective in Hell Let Loose, Postscriptum, Arma, Squad, or any other large-scale tactical game. First, if possible, select a position where the terrain helps to secure your flanks so you can focus your fires on the enemy. Second, make sure you have good interior lines of communication. You need to be able to reinforce your perimeter and resupply your key weapon systems. Third, Think carefully about where those key weapon systems should be in place. You want to maximize the overlap between the enemy unit's footprint and the weapon's sector of fire so you can achieve enfilade fire if possible. Fourth, don't forget that you have engineer assets. If you know an enemy has to cross through an open area, have your engineers set up obstacles to slow them down. Have a machine gun or an anti-tank weapon overwatching those obstacles. Then, when the enemy struggles with the obstacle, engage them with that weapon system. Thanks for watching team. Make sure you like this video and subscribe so you can get our weekly tactical content. See you next time.